Well, thank you very much for joining us today. I hope uh, you're enjoying the show. Uh, my name is Craig Swerzon, and I'm with a company called Aircraft International. I'm joined today by uh, Brian Lloyd. He is our on-staff mason, uh, who we send all over North America to do training and uh, teach you and, and masons on site how to install some of our materials and some of the new systems that we're bringing to market, and that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. So uh, with that, what we wanted to talk to you about specifically is uh, Finstone, but to give a little bit of background on Aeroscraft, we are replicating how Mother Nature makes a natural limestone. So when you look at the composition of the material, it is sand, lime, and pigment. So in Mother Nature, the way this occurs is you have sands and lime-based minerals piling up on the bottom of a riverbed or an ocean. You have water or the glaciers sitting on top of that material, compressing the sands and limes together. And then steam and heat come out of the ground, and that steam and heat create a chemical reaction that fuses the particles of sand and lime together. And what that does is it creates your limestones and sandstones, uh, marbles, granites. So this is our quarry uh, three hours north of here up in Wyerton, Ontario, where we mine a very hard, dense dolomitic limestone, 23,000 PSI compressive strength, less than 1% absorption. And we've done lots of work with that material all over North America. A lot of people think of Aeroscraft as being a manufacturing company. We are also a natural quarried stone uh, uh, quarrier as well. It can be fabricated into uh, masonry units, we can do landscape features and things like that, and it can be uh, fabricated into larger dimension stone panels. You can finish it in six, seven different textures, and a lot can be done with that. The other thing that we talk about is stone doesn't have to be traditional. It can be very clean and modern. It's really up to you as designers to use it in clean and modern ways. The Health and Medicine Museum is a good example of that in Washington, D.C., with the cantilevers and the projecting walls and uh, the sloping walls. And we had the honor of uh, working on the Montreal Symphony in, uh, in uh, Montreal with that uh, same material cladding that, the outside of the building there as well with the Adair limestone. So what we're doing with uh, calcium silicate manufacturers is we are replicating how Mother Nature makes a natural limestone or sandstone. So uh, the composition of the material is 92% silica sand, 6% uh, non-hydrated lime, the other 2% are the iron oxides we use to get our colors or pigments or, or colors to run through the material. And when you do that math, that's it. That's everything that goes into the, uh, into the material. So there's no cement content, there's no glue. That has some side benefits. One is we don't have that long-term net shrinkage that you're gonna get with a concrete block or, or, or a cement-based product. And we also don't fade over time. So if you inject cement into your material, that material can fade over its lifetime. With no cement content, the material ends up being color fast for the lifetime of the product. So we take that raw material where we then press it under 1,000 tons of force. So when you look at the, uh, the big knuckle press in the, in the plant, it is pressing it with 1,000 tons of force, compressing the sands and lime-based minerals together. So just like in Mother Nature, compressing the sands and limes together. At this moment in time, the units don't have that strength that we're looking for, like, like with natural stone, right? Natural stone, we need that last step of the process. And where that last step comes into play is these big, long cylindrical tubes. These cylindrical tubes are called autoclaves. Think of them like a big pressure cooker. So we take the material, we place it inside, we close the door, we inject high pressure steam and heat. That pr high pressure steam and heat create a chemical reaction that creates a calcium silicate hydrate binder. That binder is actually what fuses all the particles of sand and lime pigment together to form a hard dense stone unit. So a lot of people know Aeroscraft or Renaissance as a product out there. The generic name for the material is a calcium silicate unit named after that calcium silicate hydrate binder. So it's not concrete block, it's not cast stone, it's not clay brick. Calcium silicate has its own uh, category in the masonry industry. Once we create that unit, we have a blank, we can now work with that material. So when you look at the uh, rock face units, the rock face units are actually created by four individuals standing on a production line with hammers and chisels, hand chiseling the face. It guarantees you that every single one's gonna be slightly different than the next on the wall. You're not gonna get that repetitive molded or stamped pattern uh, that you would see with faux stones and cast products and things like that. Of course, the inevitable question from the design community is, well, yeah, you must create a lot of waste. We take that waste out to the back where we then crush it and tumble it, we then bag it, and then it's sold as landscape and gravel. So everything that's manufactured is used in some way, shape, or form. Nothing ever goes to landfill. So 100% use factor from everything that's manufactured. In addition to that, the color that you see in the body of the unit or on the face of the unit goes all the way through to the back of the unit. So that, it has that through body color. If you chip it, you're not gonna see gray aggregate in behind the, the painted face. 
that color all goes all the way at the back of the unit like a true natural stone. So you can fabricate that material into bull noses and water tables and caps and copings and sills, and it all matches the rest of your field material because it's all coming from the same stuff, if you will. So what does that natural process technology mean? By replicating the way Mother Nature makes natural stone, you get a lot of the benefits that you get with natural stone. So this is some of the original material that came out of the Cambridge, Ontario manufacturing facility back in 1948. Uh, this wall still stands to this day, and we didn't ship it to Nevada where it's warm and dry. It's up here in Ontario where it's survived 65 plus years of cold weather and rain and snow and sleet and hot summers, so temperature differentials. Here in Ontario, where more, most people understand calcium silicate, is a handset masonry unit. Cavity wall construction, uh, 25, 50 millimeter thick uh, cavity, 90 millimeter veneer tied to a suitable substrate um, with masonry ties and flashing and wheat vents and things of that nature. And we've done lots of that type of work all over North America. It can be fabricated in to the Renaissance units where you get more of that 12 by 24, or that uh, 290 by 590 type module. It can be fabricated into uh, random ashlar stone patterns as well. Okay, once you create that blank, you chop it up into different things and you can create other things out of it. It can be fabricated with notches and chamfers and false joints and a lot of different details uh, into it as well. About 10 years ago, we started looking at the architectural community. The architects kept coming to us and saying, you know, full bed's great. We love full bed. But we have this specific detail or we have this project we're working on and full bed doesn't work on this particular project. Have you got ways to make it thinner? And when we started to dissect some of those uh, questions we were getting from designers, and we started looking at different construction means and methods, uh, tilt up walls where you didn't have a ledge to sit full bed on, uh, curtain wall systems, full bed never doesn't really fall into the curtain wall category of construction. Projects with long ribbon windows, if you've ever tried to detail that with putting masonry above this big long strip window, ribbon window, full bed can be difficult, thin makes a lot of sense. Rain screen systems, lightweight systems for poor, poor soil conditions or the interior of a lobby, retrofit applications, existing conditions, how do you put masonry and stone on that, cantilevered, sloping or battered wall assemblies, we want to rack it out or rack it back, we want to stick it off the side of the building, maybe thin makes sense there. Soffits and barrel vaults, we've done more soffit work in the last four years than we have in the 65 year history of the company because there's a very simple detail that can be used now to, to create that soffit detail. High-rise applications, areas where you have a, a tall wall over a low roof, or uh, projects with tight lines and things like that. So when you look at thin calcium silicate, what we're doing is we're taking that thicker piece of uh, material, we're cutting it down the middle so that you've got two pieces created from that thicker piece. We then finish the faces and the edges, and at the end of the process, what you land up with is a thicker piece of uh, calcium silicate or a thinner piece of calcium silicate so it now doesn't meet code for masonry here in Ontario you have to have a masonry unit that is at least 75 millimeters in thickness to be considered a handset masonry unit we're less than that so we need some new installation systems so the first thing that we can look at is we can look at rain screen veneers so working in 90 190 and 290 heights 590 long imperial sizes uh, are there as well uh, we can cut those units in stretchers in both smooth and rocked, but you can also create corner units, keeping in mind where we're coming from. We're a full bed masonry company that now produces thin. So you can cut out that full bed unit and create that, that L-shaped uh, piece out of a single unit. It's not two pieces that have been mitered and epoxied together. We can create that in 12 different uh, standard colors and custom colors are available. Now the traditional way of anchoring stone was to use something like a dimension stone anchor I think everybody's probably seen this uh, little split tail anchor in the past and then we put that anchor at the quarter points of the stone. <clears throat> that anchor develops a point load on your substrate. So if you take that anchor and you elongate it, you can take that point load and make it more of a distributed load. So a family of anchors was developed to support the units. So this is what you're looking at right here. You've got your bottom J, your intermediate uh, J, and your top, top course J anchor. Those all get installed on the wall, and then all of the units are pre-cut in standard sizes, and they're cut with the curse in the top and bottom of the units.
From there, the key to the system are the L-bracket. So the L-bracket is what's going to allow you to engage the stone into the channel that's already on the wall. So we mount a little piece of foam tape to the L-bracket. And then we're going to squeeze a bead of silicone into the top kerf. And the reason for the silicone is we're going to take an L-bracket for every lino foot of stone. We're going to set it down into that top kerf, seating it into the silicone. That will simply keep the L-bracket from shifting or moving on you. So before the uh, silicone cures, though, we're going to take that unit over to the wall where we can now set, swing, and snap it into position. Okay. So we're setting, we're swinging, and we're snapping it into position. So the, the uh, way that this has been used for the most part uh, for the past 10 years is uh, wall construction like this, steel stud, exterior grade sheathing, and then we waterproof that. We put the Z channels in place, and then we sandwich cavity insulation between that. Okay. Then we put our aluminum stone channels in place, and then we get the clip units and clip them in. We're probably all aware with SB10, and the requirement for more insulation and things like that. So with that Z channel, we're going to get thermal bridging through the assembly. And what that does is it cuts your, your insulation value, the effective R value of your wall, by somewhere between 40 and 60% because of the thermal bridging. And if you went around the world and started looking at things through a thermal imaging camera, what you might see is things like this. Red is hot, blue is cold. See? all the stud lines that we're seeing transmitting the temperature through the wall. Look at our brick shelf angles because they weren't thermally isolated from the concrete slab. So we're seeing that heat transfer through the assembly. So the way to get around that is with this assembly here. Uh, what we've got is our steel stud, exterior gray sheathing, and our waterproofing. And then we use these discrete girts. These discrete girts are spaced every two feet up and down the wall system. And then we span between those with the Z channels. So what that allows for is it allows us to get more insulation and it reduces the thermal bridging through the assembly. And we get a higher effective R value out of our assembly as a result. So this has all been tested. Thermal modeling has been done under different uh, conditions. And using three inches of rigid, three inches of, uh, or four inches of rock wool, we can meet SB10 and ASHRAE 90.1. This is actually a project that's been installed with this assembly using the uh, discrete girts. You can see here the, uh, the discrete girts spaced every couple of feet up, 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 up and down the wall, uh, spanning between those with the uh, Z channels, and then sandwiching the rigid insulation in between, and then installing our stone channels and the stone. So this meets ASHRAE 90.1, SB10, and we can use this assembly. So some different applications. Uh, virtual Washington Township, all rain screen, soffit conditions. If you can do the vertical wall, we can lay it flat and we can do it the, the horizontal soffit condition with the same system. <coughs> right? Could we, could we use full bed here? Yeah, probably, but look at where the window starts. It comes all the way across the building, around the corner of the building. Thin makes a lot more sense when we get into things like this. Okay? What about cantilevers? Cantilevers, making it one-third the weight. The idea here was actually to create shadow boxes on, on the veneer. So getting this recess where we're getting the shadow line uh, cast across the veneer. So we've got the soffit units, corner, corner units coming back down to a sill condition. So a lot of different things can be done with this. You can mix full bed and thin together in the wall, so you're not relegated to just using full bed. You can use thin and full bed. Uh, Mirabella Assisted Living Condos in Portland doing the podium, coming up the spine of the building across the top, and covering the building in, in stone and curtain wall type material. Cantilevering off the side of the building with the stone, uh, with the stone facade. Sloping walls cutting over top of the, the windows, doing the soffit return, bringing it back. We can also do it as an open rain screen. We change the L brackets from six inches long to the full length of the unit, 
And uh, this is 55,000 square feet of open rain screen, calcium silicate material, Renaissance clip units, and all installed over top of the, uh, the curved walls, the columns, bringing it underneath, doing the soffit, or my block wash apartments. So all open rain screen type approach. So depending on the look you're looking for, if you want more traditional, you can seal it with a back around sealant. If you want something that's a little more of a, a modern look, you can go with the open rain screen approach. Uh, slope and wall conditions again, curved applications. You know, neat little details with the corner units coming back into the window, corner unit coming back into that window. All soffit installed units underneath to, to hide the hardware up, up, on, up behind. We also looked at adhered veneers. When you looked at the adhered veneer category, working in the cut stone, 90, 190, and 290 high, 590 long, those, those same uh, standard 12 colors, custom colors are available. We can also create more of a stack stone, ledge stone type of look. So that's all thin adhered material as well. Eight standard colors, lots of custom color possibilities. If you've seen adhered veneer throughout the, throughout the years, this is probably the installation system that you've seen uh, done. Now, in our opinion, this is not a great way to approach adhered veneer. From a building science standpoint, lots of issues with it. You're penetrating the waterproofing a million times with your staples. You're putting up your metal lath and penetrating the, the, the waterproofing again. Really hard to achieve air barrier status with this assembly. The metal lath can rust. When it rusts, it expands. When it expands, it expands into the mortar bed. The mortar bed deteriorates. Type S mortar scratched up over top of the metal lath isn't allowed to cure for 28 days, so it's not fully cured and dimensionally stable, okay? So when you start to dissect this, you start to see some potential issues on the building science side. And then when you go into physical installation of the materials, using type S mortar as your bonding mortar, the problem with that is it ha it, you can't put the unit on the wall and move that unit. If you can't move the unit and slide it around, the trouble is, is that you can't work out the voids in behind your unit, okay? That means you get voids, water collecting, water when it freezes expands by 10%, and now we get units potentially popping off the wall. So we need to look at different types of mortars when we're doing these adhered veneers. Okay, here's DSW shoes in California. No freeze thaw in California, but we're getting delamination. The reason is, is that type F mortar in a lab environment will get you 50, 60, 70 PSI shear bond strength. Out in the field, you're seeing 20, 25, 30, PSI shear bond strength. The bond strengths aren't high enough. So if you have long runs of wall, if you have any potential reason for it to fail, it can fail as a result because the bond strengths aren't high enough. There isn't enough deformation capacity in the mortar. Look at the deformation capacity of type S mortar. It can only deform up to about 0.1 millimeters worth, worth of movement in, the, in that mortar. When you look at uh, super flexible polymer fortified mortars, they're more flexible in their hardened state. By adding polymer to the mix, that mix is more flexible in its hardened state. It can flex and, and deflect with wind and seismic and things like that. So we really want to be up in the super flexible polymer fortified category. So the, what we're talking about looks a little more like this. Steel stud, exterior grade sheathing, air and water barrier. And then we install these insulated cement board panels. This, this is a, a panel called uh, ProGuard. That panel is uh, EPS insulation laminated directly to, or with a quarter inch uh, cement board laminated directly to it. Drainage grooves are cut into the insulation on the front and back side to allow drainage to occur within the assembly. The insulation can come from anywhere from an inch and a half in thickness all the way up to six inches in thickness. All the screws are pre-specified for it, so it, all the engineering's been done in terms of the screw and the length of the screw for the, uh, for the thickness and the weight of the material. You can adhere thin brick, thin aeris craft, thin natural stone, thin faux stone to this with the polymer fortified mortars, and you can stucco over top of uh, the, the uh, ProGuard as well. So remember that transition detail we all think about, okay, masonry down below, okay, I get up here, I got okay, where's my flashing going and stuff like that? We don't have to worry about that anymore. ProGuard, top to bottom, and then pick your finishes. So you can go thin brick, thin stone, and it, there's a lot of options there. Continuous insulation, nothing bridging through the insulation or, uh, except the nail or a screw, so it meets SB10 and ASHRAE 90.1 as well. Okay? 
So we bond our units to that. The high bond masonry veneer mortar is that super flexible polymer fortified mortar. We want it to be more flexible in its hardened state. So here's that wall assembly. There's your, your dense glass, for instance, waterproofing over top. Here's your insulated cement board panels, shiplap joints. We're going to mud and tape the joints. Here you can see them uh, mudding and taping the, uh, the joints here, right? And then we can install our finished material over top of it. So by adhering using that polymer fortified mortar. So using polymer fortified mortars, you've got six times the shear, uh, shear bond strength required by code. Uh, you've got the increased deformation capacity, air barrier answers code design challenges. You've got the waterproof membranes to protect the, the, uh, the substrate from the effects of the water. Moisture pe uh, pointing mortars give you a complete system with a single source of responsibility. And it's re resistant to the effects of freeze thaw. Okay, polymer, the, uh, polymer fortification really helps in terms of freeze thaw. System cost is similar to your traditional methods and manufacturers offer complete system warranties. Over stud, you're getting 15, a 15 year system warranty. Over block, you're getting 25 years. So you get a, a complete system as a result. Just to give you an idea of the difference between type S mortar and what, the, we're, what we're talking about with polymer fortified mortars, the Bullocks of Northridge collapsed after an earthquake. Not that we want buildings falling down, but let's look at the adhered veneer. Let's take a positive away. It's in bending. So the mortar is more flexible in its hardened state, right? Higher deformation capacity. It's been sheared right through, and the adhered veneer still adhered to the substrate. Completely different systems, type S using mechanical bond, polymer fortifies using chemical bonds. Very different assemblies, very different systems. Uh, Utah State University, this is with the uh, ProGuard insulated cement board panels, material uh, installed over top of uh, that with the 90 millimeter high uh, tile units. Raking the joints, so we're getting that drawn long linear line uh, with that material. Uh, advanced medical out in London with the uh, stack stone, again, all ins installed over the insulated cement board panels. Tile surrounds around the windows and things like that. Convergent Sciences office building using the stack stone. Chris of St. John's Hospital, that tower is 135 feet tall, tile installed top to bottom. That was hit directly by Hurricane Ike back in 2008. Not a single tile ever came off the building. Still stands to this day some seven, eight years later. <clears throat> and Carbon County Courthouse, this is another one installed over the insulated cement board panels, getting that continuous insulation and everything, even with a masonry, uh, thin adhered masonry veneer. Of course, you can bring it to the interior as well. We do a lot of interior installations with the material. So if you want to draw it from the exterior to the interior and get that continuity of that fin or blade cutting through the wall. And then retrofit. Thin really lends itself to retrofit applications. So uh, the Bank of Nova Scotia, uh, the six-story building, recladding the uh, building top to bottom. This was so successful that the ownership uh, allowed us to reclad the 11-story RBC just down the street and uh, just finished recladding that as well. So clipping all the units in place uh, with rocked and smooth material. RBC uh, out in London, Charlestown Place. This is an existing brick veneer where we're tiling over top of that, adhering directly over top. International Monetary Fund Dignitary Hotel reclad. Out in Ancaster, the CIBC with the split face block and recladding over top with that as well. And just lastly, different things that can be done with the materials features and, and chamfers, notches, false joints, bull noses. By marrying some units together, you can create the appearance of larger modules, your eyes drawn to the shadow line instead of the unit, uh, the, the, the small unit dimensions, uh, different ways to treat your joints or your corners. You can mix full bed and thin in the wall together, arch assemblies, barrel uh, uh, vaulting, uh, arch assemblies and things like that, barrel vaults clip system lends itself to this. There's your finished application. Soffit installations. The material can be engraved as well. And ultimately, we just want you to be creative with stone in your designs. So between tile and clip and full bed and random ashlers and cast stone, natural stone, 
bullnoses, caps, coping sills, water tables, really an unlimited way to use aircraft material in your designs and be creative with it and come up with stunning looking buildings when it's all said and done. So we, we're going to uh, show you the clip system. We're going to show you how we clip units in. Brian's going to give us a little bit of a demonstration there as well. Uh, if you've got any questions, we'll be happy to uh, answer your questions as, as we go along and uh, let us know. Yeah, don't be shy. If you want to come forward and actually see us clip things in and stuff like that. So the units are self-supporting. When you put them on the track, they, they support themselves on the track. So from an install point of view, labor, they really like it because basically they don't have to sit here and hold the unit while they're doing, doing this. They sit it in the track, and now they can work away. You can't you can't pull this unit out, right? We don't we don't want those teenagers running down the street with their stone under their arms, right? <laughs> but from a you know your building gets tagged, right? So the materials forgiving. We there are ways to remove tagging. Okay, there's di some different products out there that are, are successful with that, but. You have a, a leak in your waterproofing, you want to get access in behind it. We can, t we can get those units out by grinding out the L-bracket. Uh, if it's tagged, we can pull a few units out. Some of the replacement units on site, pop them in, right? So it's got some flexibility when, when you start looking at things like that as well. Yeah, so there's your bottom, there's your top, right? So we would stop the, the Z-channel here and we bring flashing from the substrate out through here and now that's the button, like a base of wall, like a deflection joint detail or something like that at a floor, floor span or something, okay? <coughs> you know, the material can be sloped, soffits, right? So you're treating this more like metal panel to a certain degree. <coughs> 